Okay, jumping into 1 John 5, finally getting to the verses that are the heart of this chapter. Uh, okay, so he says, Who is he that overcomes the world, which we've exhausted? Um, that he, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now in the Greek, the word truth there can also be reality. Uh, if you remember, Jesus said, those who worship the Father must worship in spirit and in truth. One translation says reality. Uh, and I think that's better, because Christ is the reality. Truth is objective, but reality is a person. You know, truth describes the person or foreshadows the person, but truth is for the purpose of bringing me to the person and so that I can lay hold of him in reality. And the Bible says that the law was a shadow, but Christ is the reality. Uh, he's the reality of everything. Um, some people like to say, you know, we should be happy because we're going to heaven and our future is bright. But actually... Christ is the reality of everything God wants us to give, wants to give us. You know, Ephesians says we are blessed with every spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Christ is the focus. He's actually what God has for us as our inheritance. He is our inheritance. And we, unfortunately, don't have a lot of experience dealing with Christ as a living person and as the reality we think of him as a doctrinal formula. You know, even many grace believers who are justified by faith and their inheritance is secure, look at Christ as the means for them to go to heaven. And they dispense with Christ once they get in the door. And then they go back to law keeping, or ethics, or church going, or traditions, or the world, religious world and not Christ. Remember Colossians says, don't let anyone carry you off as spoil according to their traditions, according to their philosophy, according to their vain deceit, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who's the head of all rule and authority. And we're to grow in all things into him, and it's out from him that the body grows with the growth of God. Christ is the center. Christ is the reality. He's what God has for us. And if you are missing this person, you're missing the Christian life. Because Christ is our life. Colossians says, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall be manifested, then you'll be manifested with him in glory. He's our life. He's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. He is everything. The gospel... And the Bible, the, even the prophecies, focus on a person. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. right? And he's the reality of what God has for us. And it is the spirit that bears witness. And this is the first time we see the word witness in here. We're going to see the word witness a lot. Which also is testimony or record. Um, it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is the truth of the reality. The Spirit is the reality of Christ coming by water and by blood. It's like, what does that mean? Well, if you remember, Jesus said you had to be born of water and of the Spirit. So the water and the Spirit are two different things, right? And then he said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Flesh is set alongside water as a contrast to spirit. The water is, I believe, being born of a man, or born of a woman, born into humanity, incarnation. We were all born of water. Okay, We broke the water when we came out of our mother's womb. But then, there's born of the Spirit. We need to be born of the Spirit. Um, and so when it says that he came by water and by blood, not by water only... But by water and by blood, he's talking about his person and his work. Okay? Because many people believe that Jesus 
is the Son of God who came, lived a human life, he died on the cross and resurrected. But they do not believe that the, his death was for our sins, according to the scripture. They do not believe he is the propitiation for the sins of the world. They believe that works justify. And therefore they, according to Hebrews, count the blood an unclean thing or a common thing. The blood of the covenant. Uh, this is he who came by water and by blood. Not by water, but also by water and by blood. Not just by water. He wasn't just a man. He wasn't even just God in the flesh. He's the Christ who accomplished the work and purged our sins with his blood and made propitiation for our sins and reconciled us to God and brought us near to God through his blood and made peace with God through his blood and obtained redemption through his blood and paid the price and bought us with his blood. He's paid the price. Uh, anything you try to add to justify yourself before God devalues the blood. The blood is more precious than gold which, uh, or silver or anything corruptible. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And it says, this is he who came by water and blood. You know, the Bible says that Christ came and pe preached peace to you who were far off. You say, no, I heard the gospel from so-and-so. Yeah, but so-and-so was a member of the body of Christ. And if you remember, Paul said, you know, the Lord said, so who do you, uh, he said, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus who you persecute. Jesus was making it clear that he and his body are one. <clears throat> um, and Jesus has come to you. It's not just that he reconciled you to God <clears throat> and sent you to heaven. He came to you through the blood. He secured your inheritance with his blood. And he is the inheritance. So when you believe in the blood, you receive Christ. Literally. But it's the Spirit who is the reality. Today, Christ is the Spirit. Today, uh, according to 1 Corinthians 15.45, the last Adam became a life-giving Spirit. And according to John 7.37 and 38 and 39, it says... If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. As the scripture says, he who believes on me, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And then John says, but this he spoke of the Spirit, who was not yet, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And in most translations it says, not yet given. The Spirit was not yet given. But the given is in italics because it's not in the Greek. It's really, literally, not yet. Now we know that the Spirit was the Spirit of God in the Old Testament that would come on the prophets, come on the saints, equip them for mighty works, uh, speak, you know, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. He brooded on the waters of the deep in Genesis 1. So the Spirit was there, but the Spirit as the living water is something new that John reveals. And the first time John revealed it, uh, or this new configuration, this new thing that was produced in the resurrection of Christ was in Revelation, because Revelation is written before the Gospel of John, before first, third, second, and third John. It was after his exile at Pathmos that he came to Ephesus to write these things. And in Revelation, uh, when he reveals the New Jerusalem, at the center of that city is the throne of God and of the Lamb. And out of the throne of God and of the Lamb flows a river of the water of life, clear as crystal. And that is the Spirit. See, there's been a reconfiguration because of the incarnation, human living, death and resurrection of Christ. So that the 
throne of God has now become the throne of God and of the Lamb, which means it's the throne of Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, the one who sat down at the right hand of God after he purged our sins in his own blood. And now that throne has a river flowing out that we are told we can come and drink freely of the water of life. It's a free gift, the salvation. See, salvation is not you just going to heaven. Salvation is God in Christ flowing to you as the spirit of reality, as living water. And Jesus said in John 4, uh, whoever drinks of the, this water will thirst again, but if you drink the water I give you, the water that I give you will become in you a fountain springing up unto everlasting life. And then he said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in reality or truth. For the Father seeks such worshipers. God is looking for worshipers that can come to him in reality, and for that, he had to make a way. And he cut that way through the flesh of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's own flesh, his death, and his resurrection became a new and living way for us <coughs> to be able to freely access God in Christ as the Spirit. He is now this, uh, flowing as living water to be a drink out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And it's a free drink. And that drink is eternal life. When we drank of Him, which means to come to Jesus and believe in Him, we receive Him into ourselves. That's what regeneration is. Being born of God is not just a change in status where you're adopted, but you're still just human. No, you've received the divine life and the divine nature. You've been born of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, which is Christ himself, and he dwells in you as life. That what river, the water of life, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, reached you and regenerated you and brought you Christ himself. This is he that comes by water and by blood. On the one hand, he went to God through his blood and presented his blood for you and justified you. On the other hand, because of the blood and because of your faith in the blood, after you heard the gospel, you were sealed with the spirit of promise. And that spirit is the living water, the spirit of the glorified Jesus. And we have new titles for him in the New Testament. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says he's the life-giving spirit. And then uh, in Philippians 1, 18 and 19, he says, This shall turn out to me for salvation through your petition, <coughs> sorry, in the bountiful supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. The spirit of Jesus Christ. The life-giving spirit. And then Romans 8 talks about how if... Uh, Christ is in you. Now, see, how does he... Maybe I actually have to look at it. I'm sorry. Romans 8, <coughs> 10. Uh, actually, back up. Now, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, <coughs> man, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Look at all these titles. It's the spirit. It's the spirit of God. It's the spirit of Christ. It's Christ. It's the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. <coughs> That's what we've received. This is the blessing of the gospel. Galatians 3 says, uh, uh, that Christ became a cur cur verse 13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law he made a curse for us right? that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive what? the promise of the spirit through faith now this is the spirit of promise according to Ephesians 1.13 that we were after we heard the gospel the word of the truth of the gospel we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise what did God promise? He said to Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. He, the, God promised a person, his very self. 
God has made himself available in Christ to be known by us and experienced by us and to indwell us, to regenerate us and to quench our thirst and to satisfy us from now into eternity. And can you see how this promise in the minds of most Christians has been replaced with the idea of going to heaven? And it's true. You know, physically we'll be caught up to the cloud and we'll see the Lord and, you know, but eventually heaven's coming to earth. God's intention in Ephesians 1.10 is that he would reckon, uh, head up all things in heaven and earth in Christ. Christ is the reality. Christ is the meeting place. Christ is where it's all brought together. And he's been, we've been made members of his body. We've received his spirit and now he dwells in us. And this spirit we've received is the spirit of reality. So Christ, this is the one who came by water and by blood, and it is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is the reality. Bears witness to what? His coming by water and by blood. His humanity, his divinity, his humanity, and his work on the cross. And the Spirit, this is what the Spirit testifies of. If you remember John 16, he said, the Spirit will not speak of himself, but whatever he sees of me, he'll declare to you. All things that the Father has are mine. That's why I said that what he will take of mine and declare to you. Everything that God has for Christ is an inheritance to Christ. And Christ has made us co-heirs. And the main thing we've inherited is God himself in Christ. We have materialistic concepts of heaven. We have materialistic concepts of New Jerusalem that are divorced from the person of Christ. We have materialistic concepts of the church, which are divorced from the person of Christ. And then we have naturalistic religious concepts of justification. Oh, that means now I'm going to heaven. Sanctification, that means I'm becoming better and better behaved as an individual. Right? Reward, that means I'm putting God in my debt by working hard for him. And now he's got to give me something. That's not grace. But Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our reward. Everything is in Christ, and Christ is everything. And yet we are Christians that are, in a sense, because of our focus due to leaven teaching, we've been carried off as spoil away from him, and most of the things we've heard are not according to him. And any teaching that you hear that's not according to Christ, uh, that is supposedly related to the Christian life, is going to bring you into legalism and error. But Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you continue in my word, you know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He's going to take the burden off us, as we saw in John uh, 4. Or was it? Yeah, his commandments are not grievous. His commandment is his life. His commandment is himself, living and active powerful and ever fresh in his resurrection in me to be my life that's what he's promised us is that what we're expecting because i believe god wants to train our hearts and mind that christ is the reality especially before we go home number one because we're going to meet him number two he wants to refresh the church with himself he wants to express himself in the church as a testimony before we leave, I believe. And it'll be a refreshing like wine for those who are properly watching and abiding in him. But if you don't realize that he's the goal of the Christian life, then you've got a leavened pursuit. Paul said, you know, I count everything as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And I'm pursuing to be found in him not having my own righteousness, but that which is out of God and based on faith, and to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. That is to know him as reality, not just as a doctrine. And that's what we want. And yet, we can't make that happen. Uh, only Christ has the authority to give his life. But... What we can do is want the right things. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They should be filled. 
Christ is our righteousness. Are you hungry and thirsty for Christ? Or are you just interested in being a better person? You know, religious Christians get saved and then they just want to be a better person. And, you know, they think that if they're a better person, then they'll have a better witness. But Paul said, this shall turn out to be through salvation, or for salvation, through your petition and the bountiful supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that as always, even now, Christ will be magnified in my body. Uh, whether through life or death, for to me to live is Christ. Do we know what that means? Only by knowing the Spirit as the reality, uh, the blessing, and understanding that God's purpose wasn't just to bring us to heaven. God's purpose was to make his home in our heart and to dwell in us. And when we believed, we received our inheritance, or at least a foretaste, which is the uh, promise of the Spirit. The blessing of Abraham came upon the Gentiles, which is the promise of the Spirit through faith. And that spirit is the living water proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, which is the spirit of reality, who witnesses that Jesus came not by water only, but also by blood. And again, I've gone on a tangent here, but we're still talking about what is the testimony? What do those who believe in Jesus Christ confess? What, how do I know I have eternal life? Well, he's going to tell us that this testimony that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, is not man's testimony, but is God's testimony concerning his Son. And it is the Spirit that testifies, and as he does, he brings the reality to us. He doesn't declare it just as a doctrine. When we believe the doctrine, he, believe, he brings himself to us as the reality. And we can taste him. He's the pledge of the Spirit. He's the seal and the pledge. It says in Ephesians, uh, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit promise, which is the guarantee, pledge guaranteeing the redemption of the purchased possession. And pledge there is a foretaste. It's a subjective taste of the goodness of God. And it is a foretaste of the ages to come in which, according to Ephesians 2, God will be showering the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. Our bridegroom, our brother, our friend, our everything, our life, our redemption, the beloved Son of God. So what I guess I'm trying to say is that the triune God is laser focused on Christ and the gospel is laser focused on Christ and growth in the Christian life and sanctification and all those things are laser focused on Christ. And a person who is in the fellowship. And this is what, what Paul John's talking about. He's talking about, look, we write these things that you may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to you that your joy may be full. And then the rest of the epistle is showing you who's in the fellowship and who's not. The one who says he's in the fellowship but walks in darkness and hates his brother can't be in the fellowship because he's not born of God. Because to hate your brother is specifically the sin of Cain, which involves rejecting God's way of justifying sinners through the propitiation, through the blood. You may say Christ came in the, by water, but you won't say he came by blood. And that's what he's saying here. The Spirit bears witness that Jesus came by water and by blood. And those who are in the fellowship, those who are born of God, are born of God because they've received God's testimony concerning His Son, and it is the Spirit that testifies, because the Spirit is the reality. And when He testifies and you receive His testimony, you receive Him. And when you receive Him, you receive the Son. And when you receive the Son, you receive the Father. See? This is the triune God coming to us through the Gospel. That's how critical the doctrine of Christ is. It brings God into us. Don't think when you're preaching the gospel that you're just getting someone to believe something so that they can have a change of mind. They do need a change of mind, but we need a higher view. We are bringing the word of life to men that they may be regenerated, 
that the life-giving spirit, the spirit of the water, the river of the water of life proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb can bring Christ into them so that they become members of Christ, members of the household of God, born of God, sons of God, heirs of Christ, heirs with Christ, and partakers of the fellowship. You know, it's a higher view. Um, but anyway, he says, uh, again, we're talking about who's my brother, how do I know I have eternal life, is what he's talking about now. Um, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay, so when you, when you speak the Word, it's Christ. Christ is the Word. But who is Christ? He's the embodiment of the Father. He said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. He said, do you not know that I dwell in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I don't speak of myself, but my Father in me, he does the works. The, tri the fullness of the Godhead dwell bodily in Jesus Christ, the Son, who is the Word. So, the Spirit, or the Father and the Word are one. The Word is the Son, who is the exact representation of the Father, and is the impress of his substance and the radiance of his glory. He, when, when Christ comes, God comes. Christ didn't come down on the earth without the Father. He said, the Father is with me. The Father was in him. We're not tritheists. We believe in the triune God. Three in one. They are uh, never separate, ever. And then there's the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Ghost. These three are one. That's the triune God. But then there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit and the water and the blood. These three agree in one. Now it could be that the word, water is also the washing of the water of the word. I believe that when he came by water and by blood, it was the word was made flesh. I believe it was the word coming into flesh. You know, because this epistle starts with that which was in the beginning, which our eyes have seen, which our ears have heard, which our hands have handled concerning the word of life. For the life was manifested. And we have seen and declared the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That's the word of life. That's Christ manifested in the flesh. That's him coming through water. But it's also the water of the word. You know, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my flesh, blood, you have no life in you. And he said, my words are spirit and life. And what we are doing now is we are washing in the Word and renewing ourselves in the Word, which is Christ coming to us. Romans 10 says, you know, uh, the righteousness of faith doesn't say who shall bring uh, Christ down, that is to go up to heaven and bring him down, or who shall descend into the earth, that is to bring Christ up. But the Word is on our heart, in our heart and on our mouth. The word of faith which we preach. He's saying Christ himself is the word. We don't have to go get him. He's right here. The word is Christ coming. This is he that came by water and by blood. The water, the word became flesh. Okay. And then also the flesh became the life-giving spirit. So that the word coming to us today can be spirit and life. And the spirit bears witness to the word. The, there are three witnesses on earth that bear witness that in one the spirit and the spirit bears witness to the water and the water brings the spirit what is this water it's christ in the flesh but it's also him as the word eating the word nourishment of the word is the flesh of the resurrected christ what are we doing we're nourishing ourselves we're not just learning doctrinal knowledge we want to be nourished in our inner man with christ himself as life again how Christ focused is your view of the Christian life. You know, someone said to me in a conversation, sanctification is, you know, you spend time in the Word and you grow and, you know. Okay, but what does it mean to spend time in the Word? It means if it's not digesting Christ, then it's unprofitable to you. If it's not focused on Christ, if it doesn't bring you to Christ, then it's the letter which kills the word is not, for the children of God, a description, uh, a letter, a law of ordinances, of things that you need to do to modify your behavior. Rather, it's the revelation of Christ as an inheritance. And he wants to come to you 
and nourish you with himself. That's why as the high priest, he's after the order of Melchizedek and the power of an incorruptible life, and he has bread and wine. What is the bread and wine? His flesh and blood. That's not just taking communion, waiting in line and getting a bread and wafer from a priest. That is digesting Christ so that he becomes our life and our everything. Di to digest me him means he's making his home in my heart and saturating my being with himself by filling me with a spirit of wisdom and revelation concerning who he is and he becomes everything to me. When Peter talked about, and my message did cut off yesterday, but Peter talked about if these things in abound are in you and abound, you will be neither fruitless or barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and an abundant entrance of the kingdom will be ministered to you. What is the goal? It's the knowledge of the Jesus Christ. That's Christian growth. You know, Paul said, I'm seeking to be found in him. I've counted everything as done to know him for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. The, and that knowledge is not just doctrinal knowledge. You got to see it is the word that is the water that was made flesh. And then as the spirit is born witness to, it becomes your life and your food and your drink. But it's the word of Christ. Um, and we do need to know how to separate out law from gospel. Law puts a demand on me. That's in the Bible too. But gospel puts Christ, presents Christ as the demand. I'm sorry, as the fulfillment of the demand. All demands have to rest on him. He's the burden bearer. He's the one who wants to live the Christian life. What he wants you to see is that you've been crucified with him. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And that, in, in context, he's talking about, look, I'm not trying to be justified by law. I'm not trying to build up a work system before God of behaving a certain way to be acceptable to him. I'm walking by faith in Christ, and he's my life now. It's Christ who lives in me. I'm pursuing the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, if we receive the witness of... Let's see, sorry. There are three that bear witness on earth the spirit the water and the blood now when you believe in the blood you get the water how if we're told in hebrews specifically how to approach god through faith in the blood the blood brings us near we're told in first john how to enjoy the fellowship faith in the blood the propitiation his blood cleanses us of all sins you haven't confessed your sins until you've laid your sin on the offering and put it there and said, it's no longer on me, it's on Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you're my sin bearer. Thank you that my lamb. Thank you you came by blood. Now, as you do, you will see that the Spirit bears witness. A lot of people have felt dry for a long time, and it's because they are not exercising a present faith in the blood. The blood brings you into the holiest. The blood brings Christ to you. The blood made peace between you and God. The blood speaks better things than that of Abel. You know, the blood speaks of your inheritance being secure. The blood shuts the mouth of the adversary. The blood shuts the mouth of the accuser. The blood shuts the mouth of the law. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances. With his blood on the cross, his blood answers for you. And that's what your advocate speaks. He speaks the blood, that's his language. And so you need to speak the blood. And when you do, the blood, see, how do you know about the blood? Well, it's from the water. What's the water? The Word. The Word tells us what to believe and gives us a revelation of what Christ accomplished with his blood by redeeming us and bringing us the forgiveness of sins and everything we've described. As we exercise our faith in that, the water and the blood, the Holy Spirit bears witness. And that's the same thing as what he's saying in John I'm sorry, Romans 8. We've not received a spirit of bondage bringing us into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, the Spirit himself bears witness that we are children of God and of children than heirs. That's where Romans comes into focus. 
all the things that Christ accomplished, that he became the propitiation for our sins and justified us in Romans 3, apart from works in Romans 4. For the ungodly who believes on him, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. You know, we're transferred out of him and into, uh, out of Adam and into Christ in Romans 5. And then Romans 6, we're dead with him. Romans 7, we're dead to the law. All of that becomes real in the spirit of sonship in Romans 8 that delivers us from the spirit of uh, bondage. And the way that happens is by our setting our mind on the spirit. And the way we do that is to set our mind on the word, specifically what it says about how we have access to God. Through what? The blood. You can't really, actually, you can't really be walking in the spirit without faith in the blood. The spirit, the water, and the blood bear witness and they are one. Just as God, the, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit are one in heaven on earth, it's the water, it's the Holy Spirit, and it's the blood. And you exercise faith in what the Word says about the blood and it brings you the Holy Spirit, which is your inheritance, which is Christ himself as your life, and which is the fellowship, which is the love, which is all the virtue of the Christian life, which is the power of the Christian life, the energy of the Christian life, and the satisfaction in the Christian life. And without him, you are empty. Your Christian life is futile if you are not Christ-focused. His person and his work, he came by water and by blood. And it's the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is the reality. The Spirit brings Christ to you. That's what it means for him to bear witness, okay? Now that word there is also record or testimony. And I'm going to switch over to saying testimony. Okay. It's all the same word here in the Greek, but the King James, they love the English language. It's Shakespearean. They use witness, testimony, record to give it color. But sometimes it's good to recognize that it's all the same word. So these are three that uh, bear testimony in earth. Spirit, the water, and the blood, these three agree in one. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, which he has testified of his Son. What testimony? The testimony of the Word, which is the water, the testimony of the blood, the testimony of the Spirit, which is basically Christ came by water and by blood, not by water only, but also by blood. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He accomplished the work. And that work was testified by God from the beginning. Paul talks about it in Romans, that the gospel which we've received was promised to the fathers in the scriptures, through the prophets. It's not something new. God has been telling people since the beginning of the, since the fall, what he was going to do. Peter says that the spirit of Christ, which was in the prophets, testified concerning the sufferings of the Christ and the glories to follow. There's that word again, testify. We've received the testimony of God. We have received the word of the prophets. And, and as a result, we have believed in the Son of God. But we didn't believe men, even though it was men that spoke. It's God's testimony, which is greater than the testimony of man. Man can lie. God can't lie. And we've believed, right? And it says if we receive the witness... Now, receiving the witness is more than just hearing and believing. It's also receiving the Spirit who bears witness. The Spirit is the one who bears witness. Where? In us. This is the unshakable foundation that you can bet and on and prove that you're a son of God. The fact that you believe this today means that you're born of God. Why? Because you, you know, if it was just the testimony of man, it would be argued away. But it's the testimony of God and you've received it. And when you receive this testimony, it's the Spirit and the blood and the water. It's the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. All agreeing in one. In you. This is the seed that he talks about in uh, John 4. I think John, you know, that where he talks about his, the seed abides in him. It's the testimony of God concerning his Son. Which is the Son. It's not like the testimony is one thing and the Son is something else. No. He comes through the Word. This is He who came by 
water and by blood. Uh, he that believes on the Son of God has the witness or the testimony in himself. He that believes not God has made him a liar because he's not believed on the testimony record here that God gave of his Son. Okay, if you believe on the Son of God, you have the witness in yourself. That's what he's saying. The testimony is in you. Why? Because it's the Spirit that testifies. And this is the testimony that God has, past tense, given us eternal life. And the eternal and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has the life. And he that has not the Son of God has not the life. These things I've written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know you have eternal life. How? Because you believe on, in his work. Do these words sound like foolishness to you? Is it hard to believe? You're like, man, I don't know, that doesn't make sense. Or does it resound with truth? The Spirit's bearing witness in you. Yeah, this is, a, this is the word of God. You know, and what I found is the devil could convince me at different times that maybe I wasn't saved because my behavior was so bad or because I fell into this and that. But he could never shake this testimony. This is what's abided with me since the beginning. And remember, he said, that which is from the beginning. John's intention here is to bring distracted Christians who have been carried off as spoil to everything but Christ back to the beginning of what they originally received because that's what the Spirit bears witness to. Their Christian life dried up because they lost the center of focus, which is Jesus Christ. And that is their first love. When he talked to Ephesus and letters to the seven churches he said you've left your first love this is it and what did he do he went back to Ephesus after writing Revelation and gave them this and brought them back to the beginning and showed them their first love which is not that we loved him but that he loved us and gave his son as a propitiation for our sins and whoever believes that has the witness in himself has the eternal life has received the spirit of reality is born witness to by the Father, by the Spirit, and by the Word, by the blood, by the water, and by the Spirit, and by the church in the fellowship, because we recognize those who have this testimony as being born of God. That's how we know. Again, it's not how fruitful you are, how mature you are, how kind you are, how well behaved you are. It's whether or not you have this testimony. Because it's not the testimony of man, it's the testimony of God. And you've either believed God's word or not. And you're only in the fellowship if you've believed his word. You may hate me because of what I say, but you're, what I want to do is so conform my speaking and fill it with the word that you can't reject me without rejecting the word. Make it real clear. You're not rejecting me, you're rejecting the word. Now that's hard because we're in the flesh. We, we are foolish. We make mistakes. We do things that offend. Even, you know, everybody got offended at Paul too. We do what we can. But our pursuit is to be found in Christ. And we want to hold forth the word of life for the church as food. So that they can know they have eternal life and be assured before God. You know, and have their hearts comforted and have their uh, learn how to abide in Christ and remain in Him and rest in Him and not let Antichrist take them off as spoil, according to something else. To impart as much as possible the vision that Christ is everything in the Christian life. He is the Christian life and we've received Him. God's not intending to just make it so that you can go to heaven. He gave you a person to enjoy. Uh, okay, well... I tried to speak as emphatically and focusedly as possible here. Uh, hopefully this made sense. It's kind of intense. Talk to you later.